we say that we thank you for everything that you've made available. And Father, it is our desire to get into the world, to learn more. And your aim is for us to have clarity in everything that is wailed by you. I pray, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through the teaching of the word, the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. That, Father, we shall grasp the spirit of wisdom, which is revelation in the accurate knowledge of you. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through our fellowship in the teaching of the word, Father, it will cause our love to abound more and more in accurate knowledge. I pray also in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through this word, we shall acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus. And that through the study of the word, we shall be aglow with your spirit, enthusiastically serving you the Lord. And Father, if there's anything that stands in the way of our mind or unreachable areas of our mind, whether in the form, slowness to understand, dullness of perception, indifference, bigotry, pride, unpersuadableness, or whether it's personal, private interpretations of the word or traditional beliefs of the word, which do not conform to the exegesis of how Jesus laid it down for the apostles and which the apostles followed. Father, we remove it and we allow the light to shine. I paralyze and I demand Satan to stop all his maneuvers, to desist from his maneuvers over this atmosphere and over the minds of those that are here and those that are yet to come, or those that will hear the recording later on. May the anointing flow. And I pray that, Father, the word of the Lord should have free course in our hearts. And I pray also that utterance will be made available. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the living God. Well, welcome to our daily teaching devotional. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Stanina. Thank you, excellent. Now that's double fired me up. <laughs> you know, welcome to our daily teaching devotional from the quarters of Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, Christ Revealed Center, our devotion, which is called Epic Gnosis Online, or what I call Epic Gnosis Daily. Believers Bible Study Fellowship with myself, Pastor Fred, and Lady Patience, and the amazing leadership also of this church, and everybody else that is here, and those that will come. Let us get into the throes of our study that we've been dealing with so far, on a very all-important topic that we've been dealing with, whether is the so-called deliverance ministry scriptural? We've answered that question. Lesson number 13. So in our previous study, we find out, or we found out, that there is a difference in Bible using deliverance as very different from casting out devils. The two don't mean the same. The Bible never meant the word deliverance to mean casting out devils and casting out devils to mean deliverance. In all its usage that we have trailed and examined and investigated. Therefore, we concluded that there is nothing like a deliverance ministry. Ephesians 4.11 did not include deliverance ministry. We said there is nothing like altar versus altar because the word altar means the place of animal sacrifice, the place that preachers or musicians in church stand to minister is not an altar. It is called a platform or a podium. The last greatest altar was where Christ was sacrificed on Golgotha's brow, and that finished off kind of animal sacrifices on the altar. We said that there is no need for a preaching called open heaven or open heavens, because Ephesians chapter two, verse six tells us that we are made to sit together with Christ in the heavenlies, in the heavenlies. So the believer is in heaven right now. Kebodaya, I hope you know that too. The believer, it's in heaven right now. So the rapture is not a travel. Mm -mm. The rapture is that when we shall be clothed with our new bodies. So the spirit is ready. So it will be done is the spirit inside us that will clothe us with a new body when Christ appears. So it is from within. That's why Colossians says that when Christ 
who is our life appears. Phanero is the Greek word. The appearing is twofold from within and from when he, he appears. Bam. That is what we call, that's what the Bible calls rapture, not disappearing. So there is no need for any open heaven. The believer is already in heaven. It is a reality now. And the word heaven is not a geographical location. So the apostles and Jesus never taught on anything like that. You will not find it anywhere in Jesus' teaching about altar versus altar, open heavens, break through, break back, break side, break left. There was nothing like that. Neither the apostles. We said since these erroneous topics are mostly advocated by those in the ministry, uh, by those in the ministry of the prophets, because they are the ones who, because of the tools that they have, they are the ones that push these kind of teachings. Most of these teachings come from those in the prophet, in the ministry of the prophet, whether it's deliverance ministries, feet washing, bring bottle, bring fruits, bring powder, bring talc, bring perfume. Most of them, altar versus altar, you know, incubums versus sicubums, ceramics, all these things, mostly you find them being taught by those in the ministry of the prophet. So it is expedient to examine their role, the prophet, biblically, contextually, and exegetically. Therefore, according to the writings of Moses in our four teachings, the prophet from the Hebrew word Nabi of the Old Testament was to teach the people of Israel or the descendants of Abraham the ways of God, we said in two ways. One, showing the promised plan of God in Genesis 1 and 2. And number two, the error in their forefather, Adam and Eve, in unbelief that led to spiritual death and mortality. Therefore, from the principle of first mention, the primary role, that's the key word you should never forget, I didn't say that they don't do other things, but the primary role, the main thrust, the core area of the prophet, according to the principle of first mention, is to teach people God's plan of salvation under the Old Testament in types, shadows, prophecies, and promises. We said that this was done through two ways by inspiration to fourth tell what is given suddenly and to foretell what is yet to come all on this plan of salvation, primarily. Take note that God in his foreknowledge knew that Adam would sin, but because his love is all consuming, all consuming, uh, he went ahead to plan our salvation. This means that in teaching about the plan of salvation, the core projection of God's salvation is his matchless love as his nature. So that is why you see that it is erroneous where you see the most so-called prophets, they don't project the love of God. They project fear, terror, fright, you know, and always doom. So that can be the spirit of God. Apart from the inspired utterance of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by which the prophet of foretells or foretells, the two words, you've got to be very careful, forth, T-H, to speak something as it is giving you on the spare of the moment, or foretells, to speak of something that is yet to come. He has gifts, we said that yesterday, that help the prophet in that office of teaching people the plan of God. So this office or tools or gifts predominantly in the office of the prophet is to help teach people God's plan of salvation. They are as follows. These tools, they are tools. They are tools to help him in, in bringing about the teaching or explanation of God's plan of salvation. We say that we, every born again believer of, has all the nine gifts but we see that those in the ministry of the prophet 
have got this predominantly. It could be either the gift of the, the word of prophecy is constant, then it is laced with either the gift of the word of knowledge or the gift of the word of wisdom plus the gift of the sin of spirits. Prophecy would definitely be constant. Then you see him or her operating either word of knowledge, word of wisdom, plus the sending of spirits. These are tools, I, I emphasize, they are tools to help the prophet to protect his teaching of the plan of God. The tools are to help him supernaturally to detect the following. So that when he goes and shares or teaches about the plan of God, he cannot see inside the people's mind. He cannot see inside the people's hearts. And there'll be some also who will try and preach the same thing, but he cannot know what influence is animating them to do so. So the reason why the prophet has the primary role to teach the people about the plan of God, he's got these tools of the gifts of the spirit is to make sure that in his teaching and his travels, he can detect supernaturally if the plan of salvation that he's preaching to people is being polluted by false teaching. If the people are tempted to give up on following God's plan of salvation, see that they are discouraged or they've given up. So the, the prophet has got this, this, this tools in him to detect. Like for example, I, I'm not yet there, but sometimes when I'm teaching or when I'm preaching by the Holy Spirit, I can know who is actually listening or who is not, sometimes, not always, or I can detect opposition. All of a sudden, the atmosphere becomes like hard or difficult. You can see that the words are not penetrating. So that is opposition. So then I know that somebody among us has gone to listen to the wrong thing. I can detect that sometimes. I, I pick it up. Sometimes, but the, but the prophet has it stronger. See that? And so then what do I do? By that, I have to bring correction through teaching. So either I prepare a topic to correct that, or whilst I am teaching, I will, I will, I will, I will divert, bring Bible verses to correct that. And sometimes I'll hear the person say, or later the person will send me a message that, thank you for what you explained because my mind was confused about this then I know that the person went to listen to something wrong. You see that now? So that is why the tools are given. See, if the people are tempted to give up on following God's plan of salvation, they've gone somewhere and somebody has said something different that you can lose your salvation. See, Also, the tools are given to the prophet in his office to find out if another evil spirit is trying to divert the people's attention or to disrupt the entire plan of God's salvation in the teaching. That is what it was given for. So all the prophets were to take their place of Christ in accurately teaching people God's plan of salvation. So let's look at Deuteronomy 18. 18. So don't always forget the number one primary role of the word prophet under the Old Testament. The word prophet in the Hebrew is Nabi. N-A-B-I is to teach them about God's plan of salvation. That was promised in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and how that was messed around by Adam and the effect that came through in terms of Cain and Abel, then after the flood, then after. So he must always bring those two and tie it up neatly. So look at the example we have that follows the same path. Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. I will raise up for them a prophet, Nabi, from among their brethren like you. Now, he's, Moses is talking about Jesus. He said, I will raise like you and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command. The word command means to teach. It's not command like stop doing this or stop doing that. The word command means to teach. See that? He said, I'll raise a prophet, Nabi, spokesman, mouthpiece, to teach. So any deviation from any teaching under a wrong intention under the Old Testament to divert Israel's attention from God's plan of salvation as a promise in his love was considered evil under the law, which was tantamount to death. 
So if they detected that you are not following the plan that was laid down in Genesis, that Abraham started passing it on to his children, then the, the Moses put it into law. You see that? You see, you see how very serious the matter was? Moses put in the law that the moment somebody begins to teach wrongly as a prophet, the person must be killed. It was not God. It was Moses. Because as for God, he gave only 10 commandments. And Moses added 603 laws to protect the 10 commandments. Can you see that now? So it was Moses' concern. It was Moses' preoccupation because the people were stiff-necked, stubborn, and steep in unbelief. So Moses was worried that if they are behaving like this after the Exodus, then how is it, how are they going to behave if they get to the promised land? Oh, no. So I must make a wall. I must make a fence. Do you know that the word law in the Hebrew means a fence, a wall? That's the meaning of the word law. It means a fence, a boundary to keep them in because they, are, they will not obey. So anyone that they teach or taught, was trying to teach or taught outside the original plan, Moses made a draconian law that they must be killed. Look at it. Deuteronomy 18.20. But the prophet, Nabi, spokesman, who presumes huh, to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. That is how serious it is. That is why the apostles, they were totally strict on anybody that started to teach otherwise. Very strict. Very, very strict. As from even under the Old Testament. Look at Deuteronomy 18, 22, the same Deuteronomy 18. When a prophet, Nabi, speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word, <laughs> this one is, this one is even more serious. If the word does not come to pass yeah, or prove it to be true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. So he's letting us know that when a so-called prophet speaks and it does not come to pass, then the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Look at the key operative word here, presumptuously. That means, presumptuous means you did not check. You did not follow. You just assumed that because it's the spirit of God, then he's the one saying that. That is why we always have to be careful. It's not everything that is, this is what the Lord is saying, is this is what the Lord is saying. We've got to be careful. He said, you shall not be afraid of him. And many are speaking presumptuously because if you look at it exegetically from the way we have looked at the principle of first mention, many so-called prophets are prophesying presumptuously. It is always doom, doom, doom. Yeah, there are things that are not anywhere near in line. Talking about people's color of their pants, they are, I mean, it is not even necessary. It's not even necessary, presumptuously. It was a serious indictment under the Old Testament. Therefore, from the foregoing, Tebaya, and following the Bible principle of the law of first mention, in tandem with the Jesus style of explaining the Old Testament, by beginning from the writings of Moses, the prophet has a singular core rule to teach and remind Israel of God's plan of salvation. That is their primary rule. That is their primary rule. That was the main. The gifts of the spirit were tools to help him detect if this was on course or this has been deviated from. Uh, so they were to teach and remind Israel of God's plan 
of salvation. Let me give you one example to show that. Let's, let's, let's look at one example. Let's look at one example. Let's look at one example. Mm, mm, mm. Let's look at one example. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me show you what he meant by that, that they were to follow it. Deuteronomy 6, 8. Let's, let me show you one just example. You see the same thing in the book of Proverbs, and you see the same thing littered everywhere in the Old Testament. Let's get into uh, here. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Let me show you a, a metaphor to try and let them know that they were to follow that plan. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Moses wrote it, right? Let's look at verse 8. Look at that. And these words which I'm commanding you this day shall be in your own minds and hearts. Then you shall wet and sharpen them, the words, right? As, so as to make them penetrate and teach and impress them diligently upon the minds and hearts of your children. And you and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Did you see that now? Consistency there. Then he continues. And you shall do what? Look at what? You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, figure of speech, and they shall be as frontlets or forehead band. You, you, it's like you, you tie something to your band and it's hanging in front of your eyes. Between your eyes. Figure of speech. Verse 9. And you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and your gates. You see that now? And he says that, and when the Lord, your God, brings you into the land which he swore to your forefather, there we go, Abraham, uh -huh, Isaac, uh -huh, Jacob, who are they? Prophets. What were they? Nabi, to do what? Teach the same thing he's talking about. To give you, to give you with great and godly cities which you did not build. You see that now? So when he used the words, you shall bind them. It's, it is a a figure of speech to say, you must be reminded of it constantly. Do everything not to deviate. Follow it constantly. Always. See that? Let's look at the same thing in the same Deuteronomy 11. Deuteronomy 11. Same thing. No deviation. No diversion. No something different. Deuteronomy 11, look at verse 18. In talking about the role, the constant role of the prophet under the Old Testament to teach them the ways of God, the plan of salvation. Jesus is the way. Therefore, you shall lay up these words in your minds and hearts, same thing, and in your entire being, and bind them huh, for a sign upon your hands and as forehead bands between your eyes. Look at that. And you shall teach, isn't that the word? Huh? You shall teach them to your children. Speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you rise up. Huh? Same thing. And you shall what? Write them upon the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Why? That, the, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. There's the word fathers, patria, Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, prophets, Nabi, to teach, to give them as long as the heavens are the earth. Can you see? Because God knew, God knew that in time to come, they will be mixed up with other nations that have got different ideas and different concepts. See that? And it's the same with our time. Look at it now. The Bible is almost a forgotten document because in the wake of the industrial revolution and in the wake of modernism and in the internet age, it seems to have swallowed up the importance of it. So people no longer see the relevance of the word of God. And the word of God, therefore, to them the document, 66 books in God's wisdom knew that all these ages were going to come. So he had prepared words that will protect us from the injurious influence of other words in the arts, in geography, in history, in chemistry, in economic, in industrial revolution, you know, in modernism. See that now? Whilst the world claims to be advancing, 
depression and suicide is at an all time high. Whereas when you go back into history, suicide was almost virtually, you know, sparingly. We claim we are wiser. See that? So we don't need the word of God. While the word of God was given to, to act as a cocoon to shield our mind from influences that will harm us. So once again, looking at it, they were to teach, and that's why I use the word, and remind Israel always of God's plan of salvation, that it was better, it was adequate, it was excellent, from what Adam brought, which is what a demonstration of his love. He, was, he the prophet, was giving tools of the gift of the spirit to help him in that function. So it must be noted that in that regard, the display of the gifts were never meant to take first place. They were only tools to help the prophet. Now let us review the role of the prophet in the New Testament, and this is going to be very interesting. After resurrection, if that has changed fundamentally or not, what do I mean by fundamental? Whether we in the New Testament, the way we see sporadic mess of the way so-called prophet or the prophetic ministry has gone haywire, and whether the main job of the prophet is to go around giving people prophecies, telling them the color of their car, the color of the upholstery, the color of their cat, their periquette, or the color of their centipede or the millipede. Is that what he has been called to do? Is it to organize programs and only for five minutes quote one Bible verse, but the remaining two hours, he says, push the chairs back. Now I am entering into demonstration. And he begins to call your house number, the day you were born, the flight you took to Kuala Lumpur. Is that what it's called to do? Is that what you have been called to do? So let us see if that has changed. Now, follow me very, 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 very tightly on this one. Because I am not in any hurry for us to get it right. The role of the prophet in the New Testament, we want to ascertain if their role has changed from that of the Old Testament. So recollect that from the first, from the principle of first mention, when a word was first mentioned, the role of the prophet Nabi in Hebrew was to teach about the ways of God, where in the plan of the full package of salvation that was to come in Christ after resurrection. Okay, so now let us start with after resurrection. Ephesians chapter four from verse four to 14 is a critical passage. So here I am not in any hurry. So let us see if there is any variance the way the prophetic ministry has got into a mess. Now mind me, we have got genuine authentic prophets and we have got those who are charlatans. They are in for the kill like a shark. So we've got to be very careful not to mix them up. Ephesians 4, 4 to 14. Question. When Ephesians 4, 14 to 14 was written or the book was written, what was the reference point of the writer Paul? Did he pluck it out of the eye or pluck it out of the air? No. Remember. Everybody did what Jesus did. Their only reference material was Genesis to Malachi. So that means Paul, all he did was to try and do what? To try and bridge together the fact that there is no difference in the message and the core reality of the Old Testament from what he's saying. So he's summarizing them. He's merging them to show that they are in sync. So he pulls it out from Genesis to Malachi. That is why it is smaller. So instead of going, writing all over again, Genesis to Malachi, he summarizes them here. So watch, there is one body 
and one spirit. He introduced that for you not to think that the spirit be with the prophet of the New Testament should operate or anybody in the ministry should operate is different from the one under the Old Testament. It's the same spirit of God. Just as there's also one hope that belongs to the calling you receive. What is the one hope? Prophesied about the coming Christ to take away the sin of Adam and the consequence of it in spiritual death, mortality, eternal death, sickness, disease, and the curse of the law. That is what they hoped in. The word hope means expect, expectation. One hope that the Old Testament people look to from Genesis chapter one to the calling you receive. There is only one Lord. The word in the, in the Greek is kurio. The female is kuria. It means master, lord, sir, gentleman, owner, or lady in the, in the, in the, in the, in the feminine sense. For example, in second, second John, he says that to the lady elect and her children, to the lady elect, that word lady elect is the word courier, the first lady, Ibadiah. So when he says there is one Lord, Kurio, in the word of God in the Old Testament, he picked it from the Old Testament to him, for the Lord our God, Israel, is one. Then in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change it not. One same Lord, one faith, not many faiths. The word faith is pistio, one persuasion. The word stands for one message from Genesis till now. One baptism, not many baptisms. I have heard many people preach that we have got different kinds of baptism. No, all baptisms are in sync or flow or cement into one baptism, the baptism of Christ. All baptisms point to the baptism of Christ. The word baptist or baptism is the Greek word baptizo. It means to immerse, to put into, to soak into. So I hear people say, we've got the baptism of water, the baptism of fire, and the baptism of Christ. That is a, that's a complete mess. <laughs> Whether it is the baptism of water, the baptism of fire, the two were pointing to the one baptism baptized in Christ. Baptized in Christ stands for salvation in Christ. Because when you are born again, you are taken from Satan's camp and you are put into baptizo, immersed, infused, soaked into the spirit of Christ salvation see so he's letting you know that that same message of being united with christ which was projected in genesis is the same we are preaching one lord curio one faith message one baptism same thing one god and father of us all who is above all sovereign over all pervading all and living in us all he's talking to believers yet grace Look at how he changed. What is grace? Go back. What is grace? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, the same message. So grace is the message. Was given to each of us individually, not indiscriminately. That means no partiality. The same in me is the same in John, is the same in Agatha, is the same in Magdalene. It's the same in the one that received Jesus. But it manifests in different ways in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bounteous gift. He's talking about you operate in it based on the level of your understanding. God has given everybody 100%, but some take advantage of it more than others. Therefore, now look at the point. Therefore, it is said, so he's quoting, he's quoting, when he ascended on high, that is after resurrection in Acts chapter one. He's talking about, he's talking about after resurrection in hell, in hell. He led captivity captive. Who is captivity? Every man under Adam who died and were in the Hades 
or the hell section of hell. They were in the paradise section of hell. They were rather in the paradise section of hell versus those in the hell section of hell. So captivity captive is those who believed in the message. Abraham, Adam did not believe. Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Jacob, all those that were listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And he led a train of vanquished foes and he bestowed gifts on men. But he ascended. Now, what can this he ascended mean by that he had previously descended from the heights of heaven into the depths, the lower parts of the earth, the lower parts of the earth refers to hell, the three days and the three nights. So that means that was the plan. He wanted man to be united with him and man to be ever conscious that this is the plan that I have for you. And it, is, it supersedes and it's higher than any plan that you meet in the world. So it was prophesied. I'll show you where he collected this verse from in the Old Testament. He who descended to the pits of hell is the very same as he also, he ascended on high. Look at the dichotomy. Look at the language. He who descended to hell is the same that ascended to the heavens. He's trying to let you know that there is no difference in the, in the, in the whole project before the cross and after the cross. The same subject that for the reason why he was prophesied descended into hell is the same subject, message, emphasis as the same one who ascended. So if somebody claims to follow his ministry, then the message and the attitude cannot be different. The same. You cannot say prophets under the Old Testament, their message was only to do this. But now our message is to do that. No. That's why, that's why he's emphasizing the same about whom they prophesied. Huh? Is he also, he who ascended high above all huh? the heavens, that is his presence might fill all things, the universe from the lowest to the highest. And that is why verse 11 is key. And I will tabernacle here for a while for today and we'll continue to watch 11. And his gifts. So we need to make a distinction here. Now, this word gifts is different from three Greek words that were used to talk about gifts. Okay? So let me bring you the three Greek words that are translated gift and what this one means. So we have got, we have got gifts which is, which is Doria, we've got Charismata, and then we've got Dulos. <clears throat> Doria, yeah, is used as the gift of God in salvation that we call grace. That one means it is given to you <clears throat> without any conditions attached, no requirements except you believe. Charismata, it talks about his spirit gifts, which is given to you with a smile, which you also don't need to pay. Once again, the fundamental of it is what? There are no conditions attached by faith in Christ. And that is, this, this word charismata was translated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, concerning uh, the gift of the spirit. I would not want you to be ignorant. So the word gift is charismata. That's why they say we are called charismatic Christians. Then the last one is where this word was used. So I'll put it in the same doulos. 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 Is the word gift here. Doulos. Here. Let me change the color of Doria so it doesn't mean like the same thing. So here, Doria. So the doulos is the word that Paul used here. And that means a person who serves the interest of the messenger. A person who serves, who serves or promotes. That's why it's mostly translated servant. Right. 
So the word gift is doulos, to serve in that office. But your aim is to promote the same essence of that person you are representing. So, and his doulos gifts were varied. He himself, Jesus, appointed and gave men to us. So look at the same thing. What the prophets in the Old Testament, Nabi, started in the Old Testament by Abraham to teach his children, to propagate the message, teach Israel, the descendants of that plan. Why is it that that is the main thrust and anybody that went outside, even under the law of Moses, were supposed to be killed. That shows you how serious it is. Why? God in his wisdom knows that many bodies or many types of teaching will come and man will forget. So look at, apart from salvation, look at the different teaching topics we have in the world. We can group them under three or four headings. We've got what we call the arts, A-R-T-S. You learn subjects like English, English literature, um, geography, economics, see all those things, history, philosophy, psychology, the arts. Then we have got the sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, quantum physics, psychoanalysis, medicine, the sciences. Then we've got the next one, what we call the commercial, business, entrepreneurship, all these ones, the arts, the sciences, the businesses, under which all many types of learning came, they are all man-made and they all do not recognize the reason for why God created the world, his plan of salvation. So can you see why when a person studies, I've known believers who were very serious, then they went a little bit higher in education. Then they went to do masters. Then they went to do PhD. Then immediately they became doctor. They started to argue that the Bible is fallacious and it's not true. What has what is gone wrong? He has gone to believe knowledge, man-made knowledge, which never emphasizes the Nabi, the teaching of God's plan of salvation as the main, the primary, the core, the original. Are we? I don't say those things are not important. They were man-made to allow man to survive in a man's world. And if you're not careful, it can create in you the impression that we don't need God's world. That is why the so-called the so-called advanced countries uh, say there is no God because they are looking at their development, skyscrapers, development of sciences and their arts. They, are, they, they in the physical, they seem successful and they say, we don't need this God anymore. They don't know that the message and the teaching of God is for one category of our life, the human spirit. Whereas the teachings and the knowledge bodies we have in the arts, the sciences, and the commercial world is for the, our soul and our body. But the soul and the body will perish, but your spirit will live on. So in as much as as a believer or a human being, you follow after the bodies of learning in the soul and the body, you are not complete and you'll not be fulfilled. And unfortunately, if you don't receive Jesus with all you're getting, you are on your way to hell forever. See that now? So that is why he said, keep on teaching them. So here he said, he himself appointed men to us. Uh, some, watch, to be apostles special messengers, some to be prophets. Can you not see the pattern? The purpose of the fourfold ministry is to continue this work of reminding and letting people know that salvation is important first 
because a man will physically die later, but his spirit will live on. See that now? So that same message of salvation plan must be projected. Whereas for those under Abraham and Israel, it was a promise. It was a prophecy. But for us, it has been fulfilled. So that you will not think that it is just a fad, something that just came recently. You know, I hear people say that Christianity was just recent. No, Christianity had its roots in Genesis. But under Israel, it was known as Judaism because you are under law. But now in Christ, it's not Judaism. It's not even Christianity. It's what? It's the life in Christ. So let us look at that. That's why he said that when he resurrected, he wanted that to continue. Huh? He wanted that to continue. But the reason why it was only prophets under the Old Testament, nobody was born again. So he could not let many people, he could not, he could not employ many people under the Old Testament. He could only employ prophets, kings, or priests. So the speed at which that message would travel was too slow. But he had to do something because of the Adamic nature. Now that he has taken the Adamic nature out, now he can enlist anybody, everybody, so the message can go faster. <laughs> you see that now? You see that now? That is why he said in Hebrew chapter 3, he said, um, my brethren who share in the heavenly calling. This is the calling that God has called all of us. The same way he called Abraham to spread, to teach God's plan of salvation. So he said, and he, he gave some to be apostles in the same thing. He gave some, look at it, to be prophets. Now let us look at this word prophets in the New Testament Greek. It means inspired preachers. Uh, uh, did you see the same thing? To preach is to teach. To teach comes from the word didaskalo. It means to explain. The same word expounders, explainers. See, is it different? Is it different? No. So the Greek word for prophets, Old Testament word, nabi, spokesman, teacher, expounder, nabi, he called Abraham who teach his children of the plan. And the New Testament, he calls prophets the same. Huh? Expounders, in context, the word is prophetess, prophetess, a prophet, an interpreter. This is not interpreting language. It means the same word, to teach, to explain. What are they to explain? Or look at the same word that's come up again, foretell, foreteller of the divine will, the divine plan. What is the divine plan? First Timothy chapter two. Verse number four, for this kind of praying is good and acceptable before God. Who wishes, who wills, God wills, God desires huh? that what? Every man will be saved. Number two, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Same thing. See that now? So the prophet under the New Testament is the same to teach the divine will. What he has not finished, some as evangelists, same thing. Can't you see the same? Apostle, preach, teach, prophet, preach, teach, evangelist, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, pastors, same. It's pastor and teacher. They mean the same. Pastor and teacher. Can't you see? Pastor and, pastor and, pastor who teaches. Pastor who is supposed to teach, pastor who is supposed to explain, same. So the pastor explains, the evangelist explains, the prophet explains, the apostle explains. Same thing, same thing. Why is this? Why is that? As the primary role. That's the emphasis. Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you, did you see that? He's not finished. He will explain it better. Watch. His intention after resurrection was the perfecting. Now that word perfecting 
is blind to us in English language today because you think it means that you don't have any mistakes. No, the word is maturo. It means to mature, to mature, to bring to full understanding. Huh? Look, and the full equipping of the saints. Everyone born again is a saint. The Bible makes a distinction between saints in Bible language, not Webster's meaning of saint. The saint. Do you remember that, that, that film when we were young? The saint. Roger Moore. <laughs> Simon, Te Simon, <laughs> Simon Temple with a gun. The saint. <laughs> then they put something on his head. Bing, 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 bing. Bang, 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 bang. The saint. <laughs> then they say, oh, he's such a saintly guy. Or he's a saint and his statue is outside the building because he did something nobody did. He must be a saint. This guy, no, he's not, no, 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 no. Webster's dictionary and the world's view of saint is not Bible. As for Bible, when you are born again, you are called a saint. Glory! <laughs> not based on any morality the, by the mere fact that you are in Christ. Said, and the full equipping, look at the word equipping, 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 they did, they did, they did, they did, they did, they did, Equipping, 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 equipping. The word is catatismos. Catatismos. It's like to mend, it's to like to mend a net. See, bringing it together. There were gaps. Then you take a needle and you mend it so that they become one, intertwined. So that the saints, those in Christ, will never think the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. Then they say, Old Testament, old, gone. New Testament, brand new something. You see that you have to, you have to cement that gap. Old does not mean old in English. It means temporary. New does not mean as novel, means permanent. Temporarily, they have, have to have it as a promise. Whilst Christ has not come. Now that Christ has died, it is sealed, permanent. So you are to equip the saints, his consecrated people, that, that they, all of us, will do the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? Continue the same. Nabi, prophet of Old Testament, teaching them about the ways of God as a promise, same. Minister serve. This service is different. That's what people say. What is all this Christianity? They don't understand. Our job is to make people see that it is one. And God's plan has not changed. And God loves us. Ministering. Serving. See that? Save. So you let people know in teaching, don't let them think that, oh, Old Testament is different. Why is it like this in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament? Why is it like in the Old Testament? It was like God was killing people. Sharp, 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 sharp. But here we say God doesn't kill. No. So now your job is now to bring that reconciliation. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. God is reconciling us. That is the work. All of us, whether apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastoring teacher, is to continue the work that Moses in his writings and Abraham in his prophetic encounter with God started where, where the knowledge of the Lord from Genesis will cover the earth as the waters will cover the land. Same thing. Toward building up Christ's body, the church. So the church is not a building. The church are people all over the world, you and I, who have received Jesus. So when we leave the building, the church has left. The church is not a building. Well, we may use it loosely to say a church building is correct. But the church is not the building. The church are human beings who have received Jesus, who are propagating this. Verse 13, and I close with that. That, look at, look at the aim. Look at the aim. That this, this, this understanding might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith. The oneness in the faith is not about denomination. It's not about a day that will come where we've got Catholics, 
Baptist, Anabaptist, A.M.E. Zion, Episcopalian, you know, Jehovah's Witness, standing or being to church together, Muslims, all of us, they will say, oh, let us all be in oneness of the faith. We are all serving the same God. No. He explains what the oneness of the faith said. He's, it must develop that we attain this. What is it? What is it? And here is not a conjunction. I've taught you that. You need to see whether it's a conjunction or it is copulative, which means that it is explaining what the oneness in the faith is talking about. So it should read like this, that it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith. The word faith there means in the message. What is it? Which is, I'm referring to the faith I am referring to, the message I am referring to, the oneness I'm referring to is in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. That is what we are all driving at. Started by Nabi in Genesis. That you see that there is no deep difference. Just that with them, it was a promise. It was a prophecy. With us, it has been fulfilled. Same message, same intent, same direction, same derivation, same being in sync. So until a congregation, a believer has been trained and taught to get to this level, then the job of the prophet, the job of the pastor, the job of the evangelist, the job of the apostle has not been done. It has not been done. Until a believer can understand that there is no variance, there is no discrepancy, there is no ambiguity, there's no contradiction in Old and New Testament, but it's one message started in prophecies, in types, but fulfilled now, and now, and now that it's fulfilled, it is complete, it is adequate, and if the man of the spirit is trained like this, that's when we say spiritual growth has taken place. We shall continue with this tomorrow in the role of the prophet under the old and the new, now on the new, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.